And now you progress, Nick, please. Okay, verstanden. So uh, welcome members and friends of the Deutsche Buddhische Gesellschaft Rhein-Main. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Stephen Harris, who prefers to be called Stephen, who's going to talk to us this evening um, on the subject of plants in people's lives. Um, he did originally plan to come over in person, but for t because of time constraints, that was not possible. But I, I hope that next time he talks to us, he will actually come over in person. Uh, and we can then wine and dine him and treating, treat him to some Ebelvoy, some Apfelwein, just as uh, as Bernie Uniman was uh, was describing. Um, Stephen has been the Druce curator of Oxford University Herbaria since 1995. He studied and did research at the universities of Leicester and St Andrews. Um, and after St. Andrews, after doing a uh, post uh, a PhD, so after doing PhD research at St. Andrews and, and postdoctoral research there too, he moved to Oxford to set up a laboratory for the population genetics of tropical trees. Um, Stephen's research interests um, have to do with how plants respond to human changes in the environment, particularly issues such as hybridization and polyploidy, and I have to confess to you that I uh, I had to look look at both words in on on Wikipedia, um, and the the definitions are so long and complicated that I'm not going to read them out now, but maybe other people are more uh, are more uh, versed in this than I, and perhaps you'll talk about that kind of thing um, in your talk anyway. Yeah, I will. So. Um, Stephen is also leading efforts to digitize the more than 1 million specimens in the herbaria and make images of them freely available, which is obviously very important for, uh, for spreading the word. Stephen was acting director of the Oxford Botanic Garden in 2015, and at that time he wrote a, an account of the, of the garden's history. Um, a little bit later in 2021, he, cu he curated a major exhibition called Roots to Seeds, celebrating four centuries of plant biology in Oxford. He has had books published on grasses, sunflowers, botanical illustration, and the roles of plants in Western civilization. Uh, books are also about to emerge, new books on um, plant sciences and an etymology of Brazilian plant names. And the work he is currently uh, uh, doing is um, an account for the botanical collections of an early 18th century plant collector in colonial America. So um, he's got a lot on his plate, but in addition to that, Stephen is a lecturer at Christ Church College in Oxford. He teaches and tutors undergraduates in the area of plant identification and ecology, plant population genetics and field biology. So uh, a busy schedule all in all. Now, the, the synopsis which you provided, uh, Stephen, is absolutely excellent. I, I, I don't want to, to, to go through the whole thing, but I do want to say just two things. Um, I think that all of us here in the audience know how important green plant, plants are uh, in terms of evolution of the human species, in terms of food, fuel, pharmaceuticals, air, landscapes, gardens, etc., etc. And over centuries or even uh, millennia, we have manipulated plants and the places they grow to fulfill our needs. However, and this is the really interesting part, plants have also molded the ways we live. During the last decade, there's been a resurgence of interest in plants as a means of contributing to the resolution of global issues such as environmental change, energy production, and food supplies. In this talk, Stephen will discuss how positive and negative interplays between plants and people have shaped aspects of our societies. Before I hand over to Stephen, just one last little word, and that is that uh, Michael Gierig um, attached a link to the initial invitation uh, some, some time back, um, a link to a, a wonderful interview that Stephen gave to the um, Neue Türcher Zeitung, the, the, the well-known Swiss newspaper. And I, I read that belatedly this afternoon. It's very, very entertaining, very enlightening. And um, the, uh, the title gives you, a, or the subtitle, I should say, gives you a foretaste of what it's, what it's about. And if you haven't re read it, I, I urge you to read it after Stephen has finished his, his lecture. 
it's in German, of course, Swiss German. Um, and the, uh, the, the subtitle is Im Grunde sind auch Hamburger Pflanzen basiert. Stephen Harris waltet im Herbarium der Universität Oxford über das pflanzliche Gedächtnis unseres Planeten. Im Interview spricht der Biologe über die Sonnenblume als Symbol des Ukraine-Krieges und darüber, wie sehr Pflanzen unsere Zivilisation geprägt haben. Give it a, uh, give it a go if you, if you have a few spare minutes. It's very, as I say, it's very, very interesting. So, Stephen, I've talked already probably too long. Please, uh, the, the floor is yours, as it were. Right, well, I shall try and share the screen, yeah. deal with the technology. Uh, so hopefully you can now see my screen. Indeed. Which says, uh, plants in people's lives. So um, first of all, um, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. And I'm sorry I can't be with you, but um, I am going to meet a group of students at um, six o'clock tomorrow morning to take them to Tenerife for 10 days on a field course. Uh, so, uh, so it's a bit of a, uh, an issue. So what I want to do this evening is I want to um, get us to start thinking about uh, plants uh, and in our lives and um, some of the things um, that um, and some of the stories of the plants uh, of those plants and perhaps thinking about plants in ways that you haven't necessarily thought about them um, before. And so our uh, when, we, when, when we're investigating plants, when we're justifying um, our plants, we often think of plants in terms of two things. They feed us and they cure us. And in fact, these are the two justifications, primary justifications that um, Theophrastus, who is the, uh, the Greek philosopher who first wrote um, seriously about plants in 300 BC, these were his justifications for, um, for studying plants. And he goes into huge details about plants. And the one thing he misses on his list is that plants are beautiful. Plants are things that people find very pleasant in their lives. And the image that I've, um, I've got um, on, the, on, on the screen here is in fact a herbarium specimen. Um, and it was pressed in about, um, it was pressed in about 1680. And it's a, um, it's a species that I'm sure is in some of your gardens. It's a South African species that was introduced into Europe in the um, in, in the late 17th century as a as, as a garden plant, and it is it is spectacular, um, as, and it forms these very big spikes. But we shouldn't forget that plants are are very beautiful um, um, objects in um, um, uh, in our lives, and so. Um, in, 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 in that respect, we, um, sorry, uh, not letting me, right, sorry, got the right screen. So, so in that respect, when we think about um, the sorts of contacts that we have in plants, then um, Having known that I was giving this talk this evening, I was keeping. I, I kept a rough running tally of the of, of the plants that I came into contact with um, um, with today, and this is a range of the plants that I've come into contact with, either directly or indirectly um, today. And you will see that there's a whole range of of things. There's hazelnuts and there's yams and lettuces and grapes and um, there's there's colourings, for example, like a natto and there's pineapples and and um, you might wonder why I've got fodder grasses there, and that's because of its association with milk and dairy products. And we so we shouldn't forget that plants are, um, are we're using plants indirectly. And of course, the greatest way in which we use um, plants indirectly is the air that we um, is, is the air that we breathe. So we have plants around us all the time, and. Those plants are, um, and our interactions with those plants have varied over time. And as we can see here, what I've got here is a rough table of time along the top, and then the rough areas where familiar plants in Western Europe come from. And you will see that plant that the plants come from all over the globe, except Australia, uh, and they. Um, and that we've we've had uh, different interactions with them uh, through different periods, um, from the um, 
uh, so from the uh, from the before the current era, all the way through from the 16th century um, uh, through to the present day, our, our interactions with them changed, and the um, the, the names that are, the, the, the boxes with the names in represent when those grass, grasses first became important to those to people in Western Europe and became parts of their um, um, of, 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 of their lives. And some of these might surprise you. So, um, so um, sunflower, for example, is a 20th century plant. It's a plant that, that, was, um, that was domesticated in, um, in, in North America hundreds of years ago, but it only becomes important in, in Western Europe in the, um, in the 20th century. Um, um, and um, there are others, for example, which I will talk about a little later on, lycopods, this, this mysterious group called lycopods. Why do they become so important in the, um, um, in the 19th century? Um, and you might be wondering why Australia is missing. Well, um, Australia has not produced any major um, food or crop plants in Western Europe, except perhaps macadamia nuts for that one can hardly um, think of those as 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 as, as, a, as a major as, as a major um, uh, uh, plant group. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go through a series of plants and to sort of take you through aspects of this um, of, of of this timeline. And so I'm going to cover the, I'm going to try and cover the globe and I'm going to tr try and cover the time as um, um, as well. So I'm going to tell tell you different things about different groups of plants. So the first of my plants is barley. Barley is, um, is, is, is very familiar um, um, to us as a, um, particularly in, um, in beers of, um, of all sorts of different sorts, but um, historically it's also been extremely important in bread. And in fact, it was the first of the cereals that was domesticated. It was domesticated, we have evidence it was domesticated about um, um, uh, six, um, 8,000 years ago in the Fertile Crescent. So this is this region that um, forms between the Tigris and the Euphrates in, um, um, in, in, in modern Iran. Um, and the, and um, this is, the, and we can see this, for example, in this, there's, a, there's this cuneiform um, clay, um, uh, clay tablets here, and I don't read cuneiform, but I'm re reliably informed that this is in fact a receipt for the sale of barley. Hmm. In um, um, and um, uh, uh, so we're talking about something that's thousands of years old, and um, this this very beautiful model from um, from about 200 BC from um, from Egypt. Um, shows um, um, shows people actually milling barley, and so barley is really is is really important. In English, we get the the word barn comes from um, comes comes from barley. It's got the same it's got the same root, um, and of course, barley is something that people started to um, to brew with. And as soon as you start to brew, then you start to be able to um, get alcohol. And if you can get alcohol, then you can start. Um, to think about industrial chemistry, and um, so it's one of the what it was one of the really important steps in um, the way that we um, um, that we started that we started to develop, and of course um, barley itself is also um, a um, is a traditional unit of measurement. So um, uh, so in in the UK um, the the penny weight is traditionally thirty two grains of barley hmm. uh, taken from the middle of the ear. Um, and in fact, um, British shoe sizes are also traditionally measured in the numbers of barley and in, in the numbers of uh, in, in barley corns. So that's a, a, a barley grain. And um, if and um, Britain is not unique to using a cereal for measurement purposes. If you go into all sorts of different cultures um, across the globe, the main cereals that people are using, they use those for measurements, for measurement units. And um, there was, for example, an international exchange rate between the size of a barley corn and the size of a wheat grain for, um, <laughs> for measurement purposes. So, um, so, so barley 
and cereal grains themselves start to become, um, allow us to measure things and measure things reliably. And this is, and, and again, this becomes really important. And these are things that are often overlooked. And um, bread wheat is um, it, today is is one of the main is one of the the, the four main staples that provides sixty percent of our calorie intake. Sixty percent of our calorie intake comes from four different plants, and they're they're in fact four grasses, and um, uh, wheat is one of them, and. Um, Nick was just saying about polyploidy. Well, polyploidy is, um, is the situation where you get multiplication of the complete sets of chromosomes. And so wheat, modern bread wheat, has six complete sets of chromosomes. Most, most organisms only have two, but modern bread wheat has six complete sets of chromosomes and from, th from three different species. It's a complex hybrid. And one of the advantages of that is that you get this thing called hybrid vigor. And that means that you start to, um, you start to acquire the characteristics of the different parents. And the more sets of chromosomes that you've got, the bigger you are generally. And we can see here um, a, a very beautiful image of some of the diversity that we see in, um, in bread wheat. And on the, on the right here, We've got um, um, Bruegel the Elder's very famous work, The Harvesters from, um, from 1665. And one of the things that you notice here is the height of the, plant, of the wheat plants. They're very tall. They're right up to the shoulder of, the, of, of these individuals. Taking into account that the people are perhaps a little shorter than the average now, they're still very much higher than a standard bread wheat today. Most bread wheat today is um, would is knee height, and the reason for that is is because um, these these plants have been bred, um, um, and a, um, a a plant has been a, a gene has been introduced that shortens the stem, and the reason that you want need a short stem is so that you can have a big ear, and you can have a put a lot of grains into the ear because you can imagine if you've got a big ear. On a, on a long stem, you've got this thing waving around in the, in the wind and it falls over very easily. So you need a short stem. So the question is, where did those short genes come from? Well, those short genes, in fact, come from, um, came from Japan at the end of the Second World War. They were part of the, of, of the war reparations that the, uh, that the Americans demanded. They were the short grains, but they were the, the short wheats that, um, that the Japanese um, traditionally cultivated. Where did the Japanese get their, their, those short wheats from? Well, they got those short wheats about 300 years earlier from Korea as um, through, um, through a, the Japanese Korean wars. So you can see that these things are moving um, around. And of course, those short wheats are the basis of what the, of the so-called green revolution of the 1950s and 60s. So, um, so, um, so genes are moving um, um, are, are moving around, and of course, because of the way that we grow um, these uh, these wheats, because these this wheat needs so much tending, then it forces us into certain patterns of behaviour. It forces us to cultivate in certain manners, and so um, so. Um, the plants are determining aspects of our lives. Going, moving slightly away um, from the um, uh, from the grain crops, cereal crops. Um, obviously, the, we have these um, these plants, these 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 medicinal plants, which are um, are really important. Um, so, until the um, essentially until the end of the nineteenth century. The only decent sources of medicines in um, um, were from plants, and um, there were certain groups of plants that were really highly valued. And one of those groups of plants that was highly valued are the anaesthetics. There are relatively few plants that are, have anaesthetic properties, particularly in Western in Western Europe. Um, one of them was the opium poppy, and the other is this group of plants around, um, around mandrake. 
So Mandrake is a member of the potato family. Um, um, and um, Mandrake itself is, um, it's native to the west, uh, to, um, to the Eastern Mediterranean region. And it's, th it's built up this enormous reputation uh, um, based on the shape of this root. And this is why it's called um, a mandrake, a mandragon. And um, because of this anthropoid shape of the root, and in this case, this is an extreme example of, um, of this, by an otherwise very good artist, um, uh, it, it, extreme male form. There's a lot of legends been moved up around it. So for example, it was believed that the only way you could, that you could harvest this um, without um, dying yourself um, was because it was thought to scream as you pulled it from the earth, was um, the traditional way to do it is to have a sword or a spear, draw a circle around it, tie a dog, to the top of the plant, give the dog a good kick, it runs off and pulls up the plant um, um, with you. And, um, and at the end of that process, you have to kill the dog, apparently. Um, and so the very early images of mandrakes that you see, you almost in invariably see them with a dog attached to them. Of course, there's nothing in this. Um, this is, uh, but what is important is that these plants contain a series of um, al uh, alkaloids, chemicals that have very specific physiological effects. Um, um, and so things like atropine, um, for example. So um, they lead to pupils being dilated. Um, they have soporific effects. Um, if any of you suffer from, um, um, from travel sickness and take, take travel sickness pills, um, you um, probably that you're probably taking a substance called um, scopalamine. Scopalamine is isolated from mandrake. Um, and, um, but, the, uh, but the fact that you have these really active compounds in plants is, um, um, is, really, is, is, is really important. And huge value has been associated with this. And I'll come back to this point um, in, um, um, in a moment. Another important plant in the um, um, in the um, in the fifteenth um, in well in the fourteenth fifteenth sixteenth century seventeenth century is cannabis. Now, um, when we think of cannabis today, people often get um, think of cannabis in terms of the drug, the um, uh, tetrahydrocannabinols. But um, historically, cannabis has been much much more value valuable as a source of fiber, as a source of so-called hemp. And there are two subspecies of, um, of, of, of cannabis that are known. Um, um, and one of them is distributed in, um, in, um, uh, in um, uh, South Asia. And the other one is naturally distributed in, in, in Central Asia. And it's the Central Asian one that produces the hemp. It's the South Asian one that produces the um, um, produces the cannabis produces the um, cannabis resin, the uh, tetrahydrocannabinols at high concentrations. And um, the reason that hemp is so important is that hemp essentially held the sh uh, the ships together during the great ages of of of, of, of sailing. Um, a ship like this had hundreds of tons of ropes and fibers associated with it. And it was all cannabis, it was all hemp. And similarly, the sails. Hemp has a particularly interesting property um, in that um, it's not, um, it doesn't break down very, um, very easily when exposed to large amounts of ultraviolet light, which makes it ideal as a sail clock. Um, now, if you, if you want to produce high quality fiber, from, uh, um, from, from, from cannabis, from, from the uh, Central Asian subspecies, that's the one that's grown in Europe uh, naturally, um, then you need to um, use the male plants because uh, cannabis has two, separate, uh, it has two separate sexes. Most plants have, uh, are both male and female, but cannabis has two separate sexes, males and females. So if you want to produce high quality um, rope, you want to produce, you want to be um, isolating your fibers from the stems of the male plant. If you want to produce high quality resin, then you want to be extracting it from the um, from the um, 
the flowers of the female plant. Um, and um, we can see um, um, and, um, uh, these, these plants are very different in terms of their, um, um, in terms of their morphologies. Um, so, um, and um, again, going back to, going back to cannabis, uh, going back to polyploiding, in the 1960s, in, uh, there was a lot of interest in, um, in polyploiding when it was realized that high polyploidy plants of cannabis produce very high quantities of cannabis resin um, and with lots of tetrahydrocannabinols. And so there were all sorts of um, methods used to try and increase the numbers of chromosomes that were found in these, um, um, in, in, in these plants, producing all sorts of mutants. So again, um, our behavior is being dictated by, um, the, by the plants themselves. Another resin that becomes important in the age of um, in the age of sale and remains impo it, um, important today is the resins that you get from pines and pine resins. Pine resins were really important for um, filling in the gaps in um, in timber boats um, for the caulking of um, of of, of, um, um, of, of timber boats, um, but also really important um, for um, again. Uh, for uh, varnishes, but also as sources of um, of chemicals for in um, in early petrochemical um, 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 industries, things like bitumen, tar, um, all of these types of things are isolated from pines. And of course, uh, pine timber itself is is um, is extremely important. Um, in, in, in Northern Europe, pine is one of the main, um, the main timbers that are, are used. Um, and of course, it's one of the um, timbers that we describe as a, um, describe as a softwood here. Um, this particular tree here is a, <clears throat> is a tree that had to be felled um, in the Oxford Botanic Gardens about, um, about 10 years ago. Um, the tree itself was in fact planted in, um, um, in, 18, um, in 1834, um, and it's a black pine, for, and it was from seed, in fact, collected from just outside Vienna. Um, and, um, uh, but um, again, lots of species of pines. Pines are not just um, Northern European. Um, they are found across the Northern temperate regions. Um, and in fact, the highest diversity of pines is in Mexico, is in the mountains of Mexico. Uh, uh, and Central America, um, rather than not in um, perhaps Northern Europe, North and North America, as people might think. Um, and <clears throat> so going on from resins, we come on to dyes. And um, of course, the um, when we think about dyes, one of the um, uh, one of the big dyes is indigo. And um, the major source of in indigo for most uh, in, uh, across most of, of, of Europe, and in fact, a, a main source of wealth for um, many European cities, in particularly in the um, in the Middle Ages, um, was uh, was this thing, woad. Woad is a it's isolated from a member of the cabbage family, and um, certainly in um, certainly in the UK is very strongly associated with the Celts and the painting of, of, of the um, of, um, uh, Celts painting their bodies. Um, and um, the Romans, in fact, of course, um, called the Celts Picts, which means, um, uh, which means painted, painted people. Um, and it's because they stained their, bo their bodies or are said to have stained their bodies in, uh, with, blue, um, with this blue dye. The blue dye itself, is isolated from um, from uh, from this uh, from this member of the cabbage family. The process of of isolating the dye it involves some really sophisticated chemistry um, and some really sophisticated knowledge of of of, of fermentation of 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 changing concentrations of um, of, of, of of dyes in water. And um, actually, what happens when you add oxygen to to solutions in order to precipitate out the blue dye? This dye itself is, uh, or the plant itself, was a um, 
requires very high quality land to grow on. And in fact, in the UK, in, um, in the Elizabethan period, so this is, um, uh, this is the late 1500s, there were edicts that, that stopped um, people actually using agricultural land for growing this plant because the British population was starving because people wanted to grow this because of the high value that was associated, um, um, the, the high value that was associated with it. Of course, the dye indigo is um, uh, uh, become later is isolated from a um, from a legume, particularly in India, and um, of course that leads as well to um, a great famine in the early twentieth century in um, in India for exactly the same reasons that um, there was this, there's this um, balance or this balance between the land for growing a dye on as, as a cash crop and the land for growing food. And um, um, the, in, in British India, there was the demand for the cash crop, um, but the, um, uh, the, the dyes were, uh, the, um, there were very poor, there were very poor crop years. Um, and the, um, the British authorities demanded the dye rather than um, feeding, um, feeding people. Um, so we see the same patterns repeated in terms of our relationships with some of these plants. And again, the Romans, again, are associated with this plant. This is pepper. This is a very, it's a very beautiful um, um, pepper pot. From, um, uh, from about um, 300 AD um, that was found in, um, found in England. Um, and of course, pepper was a hugely valuable spice coming through the spice, spice routes, through, um, through Constantinople, through the trade routes um, from, um, um, from the East. And um, uh, uh, this is a specimen of, um, of, uh, of, of black pepper collected in India, very rare at this time. This is a late, uh, late 17th century specimen. Um, and in this period, a handful of peppercorns would have, um, would have bought you a house. Um, they, are, they, they were enormously valuable. And this is where we get the idea in English of the phrase, a peppercorn rent. Peppercorn rent today means something that's almost worthless. At the time, it certainly wasn't. A handful of peppercorns was a serious amount of money. So, um, and so we need to take into account that things change. And of course, the thing that changed here was that um, this was brought into cultivation and people started to grow this in plantations and then the price drops. We see the same happening with things like nutmeg, with cloves, these very familiar, um, very familiar spices. And um, wars have been fought um, um, over these. I mean, the British were essentially constantly at war with the Dutch in, in, in the East Indies for the spices and for the spice fruits. And um, in fact, it got to such a stage that um, nutmeg is found only on one island in the, um, in the spice islands, in the Moluccas, and the, which was controlled by the British. It got to such a stage that the British, in fact, ended up giving the, the, that island away to the Dutch, when in fact they exchanged it. The island that they exchanged it for was Staten Island, which is now obviously part of New York. Um, and um, uh, but what, at, at that stage, what the Dutch didn't realize was that the British or the French, in fact, had managed to cultivate nutmeg. And so the monopoly had been broken. And so the price drops. Um, so again, there are all these little stories in your spice cupboards that perhaps you hadn't even thought about. And another one, of course, in, uh, that um, you'll be very familiar with is the chili. Chili is an American, um, uh, is an American plant. Um, very early introduction into, um, um, in, into Europe. And it was primarily used as a substitute for pepper, for black pepper. It was much, much cheaper than black pepper, much easier um, to grow. And of course, again, this is another late 17th century um, specimen, very beautiful specimen. You can see the chili uh, fruits here. 
This is a uh, this is an early 18th century drawing of the same um, of the same thing, and um, the um, the substance, the chemical that I'm sure that you're all familiar with, is called capsaicin, and um, capsaicin is one of these chemicals that uh, that that humans have a real attraction for. We will go a long way for that for that um, for that flavour, and. The capsaicin is, in fact, um, it's restricted to not the whole fruit, just parts of the fruit. It's a small part, it's that part where the seeds connect to the rest of the fruit. That's where the capsaicin is concentrated. So if you want to reduce the heat of your chilies, remove the seeds and remove that piece of um, that strip of tissue where the, where you've got the um, uh, where the seeds connect to the fruit. The other thing, of course, is that uh, is that capsaicin uh, chilies are measured by Scoville units. Um, Scoville unit is, um, is 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 essentially the um, the amount of uh, the, the, the amount of dilution that has to happen before you can no longer detect the chemical. Different different chilies have different um, uh, amounts of capsaicin in them, therefore they have different heats. Some of the hottest chilies have, uh, uh, have over 40 million Scoville units. Uh, it's unbelievable that anybody would even attempt to eat that. There's a lot of psychology associated with why people actually eat, um, eat chilies. Um, um, I don't know whether any of you have a problem in your, in your gardens with squirrels, eating uh, perhaps nuts that you might put out with the birds and this type of thing. It's certainly a problem in the UK. Um, if there is, then what you do is you coat the, um, you just put chili powder over the, over the nuts. Mammals respond to capsaicin. They're, they're deterred by capsaicin. Birds are not. Birds have no receptors for, um, uh, for capsaicin. So, and in fact, uh, chilies are bird dispersed, so um, birds don't um, um, birds don't register them. So um, capsaicin will uh, chili powder will deter um, uh, um, squirrels in, in a non-aggressive manner. Um, another plant that's also in the potato family. So we've seen now three members of the potato family: mandrake, chilies, and now tobacco. Tobacco is something I'm sure you're all familiar with. Tobacco is a species that was introduced into, um, um, into Europe again very early, and it takes off very quickly. It's one of the most addictive substances that we know. And, um, and it's also the plant that's probably killed more people than any other plant on the planet. Um, and um, um, and it's also the plant that becomes the first global currency. So within about 30 years of this plant being introduced into Europe, this plant becomes, a, a tobacco becomes a currency, uh, any acceptable anywhere in the, in, um, um, in the world that Europeans are having um, contact with. It is that, um, it is that, um, that addictive. But this is a species that was that was introduced from the Americas. It's it, it's used traditionally. Used, it is actually a species that was uh, domesticated in um, in Amazonia by Amerindians in Amazonia, and spread through the Americas very rapidly. But in the Americas, it's primarily used for medicinal and um, for ritual purposes, rather than as a um, as, um, uh, as as a recreational as a, as a recreational drug. Um, and of course, fortunes have been made on um, with tobacco, and of course, um, yeah, uh, uh, huge uh, been huge cultural shifts um, associated with tobacco, tobacco consumption, particularly and um, particularly tobacco growing, and the and uh, the creation of slave plantations in Virginia were associated with um, um, with tobacco. Um, another plant that is perhaps, that is addictive or was addictive in its way, um, at least, but in a slightly different way, is this thing, the tulip. 
Tulip is a is a species that we grow very widely in our um, um, in our gardens. It was introduced into um, Western Europe through, in fact, um, the Ottoman um, Empire, and in fact, through the um, um, through the um, uh, through the Habsburgs. Um, and <clears throat> it comes into uh, comes into Holland. In Holland, um, um, in the 1630s, we get this situation where you create this, um, people are speculating on, um, on tulips. And so this is a, um, uh, this is a, a, a very beautiful still life from the, um, uh, uh, from 1639 um, by a Dutch artist, showing a wide range of different, uh, different tulips. And these tulip forms became hugely valuable. And particularly these, Tulip forms here that we've got these so-called Rembrandt tulips, the the feathered, um, the feathered type, and um, huge sums were um, were um, was uh, were were paid for a single bulb, um, and you know a single bulb could 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 be the price of a house. These are the sorts of the prices that we're talking about, but of course. The this interest and uh, excitement over tulips is much earlier than that. So the Ottomans are the first to start seriously taking seriously um, tulip domestication, and this is a very typical Ottoman tulip. They have this very flame-shaped um, flower head, whereas the the Dutch and most people today prefer these more goblet-shaped um, um, heads. Um, the genus itself is um, is Central Asian in um, um in, in origin so the so the ottomans were moving into central asia in order to get these um to get these tulips which were um used in order to um uh, to um gain favor um particularly with the sultan who the, the, the sultans who took these these tulips on as um as 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 symbolic of their dynastic power um but again they have all these um, all these different associations. We mentioned the Ottoman Empire. We mentioned the British Empire, and of course, there's a big argument associated with um, uh, the European empires as a whole. And um, the European empires could not have established themselves, or would have found it very difficult to establish themselves, if it wasn't for one drug, and that drug is this thing, isolated from um, from this plant. Quinning, and it's an anti-malarial, and um, in fact, it was. It is it, until the early nineteenth, until the early twentieth century, it is the only effective um, anti-malarial that is known in Western Europe. There is, of course, an anti-malarial that is well known in China, but was not known in Western Europe. But this is the this is the anti this is the anti-malarial that was uh, most widely uh, that was most widely sought often called Peruvian bark, Jesuit bark. Um, and it, it's, uh, it comes from a genus that's in the coffee family. It's, um, it's indigenous to the Andes. Um, and um, uh, until the mid 19th century, all quinine was coming through those trade routes that, uh, that went through the Iberian, um, the Iberian Peninsula. And of course, as you might expect, with um, with a drug that's highly valuable, there was a lot of forgery um, going on, so that basically anything that was remotely bitter would be um, would be treated as quinine, um, and people had all these magic nostrums as to um, how to make um, uh, quinine most effective. Um, there was an English um, there was there was an Englishman who sold his recipe to Louis the Fourteenth for an enormous sum of money. Um, and it emerges later that in fact the, um, the 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 trick is to rather than dissolve quinine in a uh, quinine bark in water, is to use wine, and it's the alcohol that um, that dissolves the alkaloids, and that's the important thing. So we're coming back to alkaloids. We're coming sorry. We're coming back to alcohol again and chemistry, and of course the. Um, in the 19th century, um, the British and the Dutch both um, go into um, South America, collect seed illegally, um, and, and, and particularly from Bolivia. Bolivia ha has the first laws that protect certain species in the world, in fact, 
but the British um, just went in and got um, and, and took them. Established the these plants in India, and it's um, it's the quinine that's isolated from those plants that becomes really important for um, the uh, for um, and also in Java for the Dutch that becomes very important for the the, um, the colonization of, um, of Southeast Asia and South South Asia by uh, by the British and the Dutch. Um, and um, but one could go on for uh, one could go on for a long time about um, quinine. So I'm going to stop uh, talking about quinine there. Another major source of calories. So another one of those, uh, another one of those forty, uh, an, another one of those four plants that contribute twenty percent of our um, of, of our diet is sugar, and most of the global sugar comes from this plant here. That is not the case, of course, in Germany. Germany has a different source of sugar, but the major source of sugar globally is this thing, and it's a grass, it's sugarcane. And sugarcane is in fact Polynesian. It comes from Polynesia, and um, the canes themselves were used ritualistically and as weapons, rather than as a major source of food. Um, uh, sugar is also a very high polyploid. In fact, sugar very rarely flowers. Most sugar is um, is is propagated vegetatively, um, but sugar cane requires a huge input in order to um, grow effectively, and that's uh, one of the reasons that um, we end up when it gets transported into the Americas by the um, by the Spanish. Why the establishment of sugar cane happens in the Caribbean? Because um, there's a there's a re ready source of slave of of, of, of labor through um, um, through slaves. So um, uh, and we have uh, we have here a, a, a famous image, in fact, from Debray's um, uh, work, and this is in fact um, showing sugar being um, being pressed to release the juice, which would turn to be turned into sugar in Brazil. And um, Brazil takes on the same um, on, on, on the same um, on the same role uh, um, as well. But um, again, large amounts of wealth generated from this plant, producing large amounts of um, uh, large amounts of sugar, um, huge energy a huge energy source. Um, many European cities are built on the basis of um, of income from. Um, um, from sugar sugarcane plantations. And of course, there's this. This is the lycopods. Lycopods are uh, uh, today lycopods these things. They are um, uh, lycopod is uh, literally means a uh, wolf's foot. And it's a reference to the, the shape of the tops of these these stems here. That if you're a, if you sort of squint your eyes together, um, and are a sort of 18th century botanist with nothing better to do. They look a bit like wolf's, wolf's, the pads of wolf's feet. But this is a group of plants. Everything else that we've been talking about so far are so-called flowering plants. This is a group of plants that's closely related to the ferns. There's only about um, 500 species um, today, and they're relatively small um, things. In the Carboniferous period, when coal was being produced, these were enormous trees. Um, uh, 10 to 15 meters tall, these, these plants were. And it's these plants that form the coal deposits, that the major coal deposits are, um, are formed from these plants. These are also the plants that are used for um, uh, the, our dinosaur food. So dinosaurs were eating these, and it's the dinosaurs that are dying and the animals that are around them that are producing the oil and gas. So these are the plants that, so it's the carbon that's fixed by these plants. And this is a section through a fossil one that we are worried about being dumped into our atmosphere today. So, so we're having this massive movement of carboniferous carbon into the present day. And it's all being mediated through these, through these plants. So these, um, so, um, when you think about carbon and oil and gas, it's these plants and their relatives that you should be thinking about. And 
um, of course, um, a very important drug plant for, um, uh, for, uh, is um, a very important group of drug plants from, from a recreational point of view, a caffeine. Caffeine is produced by four major plant species um, on the globe, and, and humans have found them all and use them all. And this is one of them. This is tea. Tea is, um, is a species that was introduced, um, that, that was following these trade routes that we've already mentioned from China, cultivated in, um, um, in China. And in fact, until the mid 19th century, Europeans had no idea that green tea and black tea were in fact from the same plant. They thought they were from different species and it's all to do with processing. Um, Western Europeans didn't know how to process tea. And um, that, that knowledge comes with um, in the mid 19th century when, um, when of course we, um, uh, there's, a, uh, there's a whole series of things going on in, um, um, in China. And um, there's, a, there's, there's a plant collector called Robert Fortune um, sent out by the Royal Horticultural Society he smuggles his way itself into China, collects the seed from uh, from uh, uh, from uh, tea plants, and takes out Chinese people that have knowledge of how to process and grow tea um, at the same time. And then we have um, this great rush to start growing tea, and of course that tea is then introduced into um, into India, and of course. Um, the Botanic Gardens in Rio, um, which was established in 1808. One of the reasons that garden was established was in order to try and grow tea to push into the English market. Because that, at that time, Britain was the major consumer of tea in the world. It is said that the British Industrial Revolution was, was fueled on the basis of three things, tea, bread, and sugar. Um, and, and that's what the, the workers that were associated with the, uh, the Industrial Revolution seem to have, have, have consumed. Um, and um, in, a, in the modern era, so moving into the 20th century, a plant that we, we see having major, major dramatic effects on landscapes is soya. So this is, a, this is an early 18th century image. In fact, this is the first image we know of, of soya. Soya was, was, was traditionally grown in, um, in China, it's a Chinese species, which then slowly introduced into Europe, but it, uh, into, into the West, but it only becomes really important um, in the 20th century. And it becomes, and, and um, because of the protein that it contains, and particularly as an animal food, as an animal fodder with industrial farming, we end up uh, needing to produce large quantities of soya of species that have got large amounts of protein in them. And we see that um, that happening, what happens is that, for example, in Brazil, where large amounts of soya are grown, so in central Brazil, there's a forest in central Brazil, which in, in its native way looks like this. Um, it's called the Cerrado. It contains a third of all of, 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 the, of the plant species that occur in Brazil, occurs south of, of Amazonia. Um, very few people have heard of the Cerrado. It's a dry forest, a beautiful forest, um, and, um, but most people have heard of Amazonia. It's this forest that's being systematically stripped in order to grow soya. And the reason that they, they want to grow soya uh, the, 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 in Brazil is to feed the European market. And the European market, uh, because Brazil does not grow GM, uh, GM soya, it grows GM free soya. So more, almost all European soya comes from Brazil. And this forest, this forest here, this type of forest here is being stripped away as you can see here. So the distance between here and here is about 70 kilometers. It's about the distance between Oxford and London. And, um, we can see that this is native area. This is the plantation area. And um, this is an area that um, I do a lot of work in Brazil. When I first went to Brazil, the, the whole of this area looked like this. First time I went to Brazil, this area was in 1995. This um, image was, um, um, was taken in 2015. You can see that in 20 years, 
you've got this massive uh, stripping away of the, of the forest. And that's almost entirely to grow soya, to feed the European um, uh, 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 market for um, animal fodder. So my final slide, you'll be pleased to know, is that is this thing. So this plant here, Thalecress, um, you, you may have not have heard of it. You may have you may have actually heard of it as the scientific its scientific name. Its scientific name is uh, the genus is Arabidopsis. The reason it is here is because this is the plant that we probably know more about than any other plant now growing. It is it has become the model organism for studying um, uh, plant biology, uh, particularly genetics, developmental biology, and. This is an, an, an image, this is the first image ever published. Um, it's published in 1588 by, um, by Johannes Thal um, 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 from a, an obscure um, little, um, um, little flora um, called, the, um, called the Flora Hacinia. Um, and um, this is, this is a, an image that's tacked on at the end. And this is the plant, this is this first image, this is what it's more familiar with. I'm sure it's growing in your gardens. It'll be growing in your gardens, but this has become the, the model organism. And one of the reasons it's become the model organism is that it's very short lived. You can get from seed, um, from a seed germinating to a seed being, pro uh, being produced in 14 days with this plant. It's got, very, very, it's got a very small um, uh, genome. Uh, I, it's got a very small amount of DNA in it. It's the first plant that had, that's had its total DNA um, sequenced. Um, and there are lots and lots of mutants. Um, and in fact, almost all of the mutants that were first used from this, in fact, come from Germany. Um, there, was a, there, was, there, was, there was a German geneticist in the 1930s who was building this massive collection of, of, of mutants for this plant for no other reason than curiosity, that he, was, uh, that, that he was fascinated by all the different forms of this plant. So he built up this collection. This collection becomes in the 1980s, um, the collection from which all of this work on understanding these plants, uh, um, or understanding to understand plant biology um, at the cellular um, genetic level um, um, emerges. Um, so what I hope that I've done this evening is to just give you a quick um, go through a sort of a lot of different aspects of um, um, of plants, perhaps getting to think a little bit more about some of the plants with which you're familiar and the fact that they all have each of them has their individual history and their individual history of interaction with um, um, with us. And it's not always um, a, a, a case of the of us exploiting the plant, often the plant ends up exploiting um, us and forcing us into certain modes of behavior if we wish to consider continue using that plant. Thank you very much for your attention. Stephen, that was absolutely marvelous. Thank you very much indeed. I'm not sure whether people have uh, been able to, uh, to press the, the clap symbol or the the thumbs up symbol, but uh, I'm sure everyone has really, really appreciated that. I, I must say, I found that, well, in other words, no, you've you've opened up a whole new world for me personally, um, and you've 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 made uh, huge connections in terms of not just plants but also geographies and history and culture. Uh, really fascinating. Thank you very much indeed. It's an absolute pleasure, Michael. Would you would you like to run? um the q a well why not so uh but, you, but you before can... i before before i sort of finally hand over to you for that i i have a fair amount of housekeeping after the the, the q a please yeah okay so uh, you can use the chat button to uh, forward your questions uh, in writing or you just uh, raise your hand and uh, then you can Posed your question. Probably, Stephen, you uh, switch off. Uh, I think this is uh, Tenerife that you have here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, right, right. Sorry. Yep. Sorry. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, it, so, it, it is Tenerife. You're uh, already there, obviously. No, no, no. no I'm, uh, <laughs> <laughs> 
So, uh, Dr. Yunuman, please. Yes, I have a question. How do we grow plants in future? I mean, we have uh, doubts about uh, using too much fertilizer. We have doubts about uh, cultivating too much area um, uh, and, and destroying forests. So do you, you, do you think um, that this movement of organic farming or so will change the way we use these plants in the future? I think it has to. Um, I think uh, I think there's no um, I, th I think what what we've got to do is we've got to use the land that we have more smartly, and um, it, 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 and you, we can see that in, in 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 a number of ways. So we've got to think about fertilizers and the way that we use fertilizers, and and this this approach of just throwing fertilizers onto the soil and then watching most of it leach away is just not going to is, is just not going to work um, because of course it's ending up polluting water courses and this type of thing and also it's causing massive erosion and that's one of the things that people often uh, forget is the loss of the soil and it takes thousands and thousands of years to replenish soil so we're going to have to find ways of farming that um, maintain and replenish soils and of course Traditional farming methods have done that. This is one of the things that good farmers do is they look after their soil. So it's things like maintaining a cover. So using using cover crops, um, this type of thing, interplanting um, so that you're not necessarily plowing uh, vast areas up. There's also the um, not pulling into cultivation new land. So what I showed you of, 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 of soya is the sort of is one of the worst case scenarios of, of, of taking um, virgin forest and just then having to fertilize it massively. Um, and in fact, also putting massive amounts of lime onto the soil um, in order to get a crop that is only viable for a few years. And then you, can, then, then you sort of go on to the next area. Again, that's not going to work. So we're gonna need to do, we're gonna need to do that. And I think we're also gonna need to have, we're gonna need to, to have to think about how we use use cities for farming um, purposes as well. There's a lot of areas in cities that one could potentially use for for farming uh, for farming purposes, and so I think it's it, it's thinking more intelligently about the areas that we have available, the the ways that we use the soil, and and also the sorts of things that we grow. Um, and but of course, one of the difficult things about what we grow is that people are very resistant to changing food cultures. Food cultures change relatively slowly, um, and um, uh, so uh, again, but but they do change. For example, see how um, uh, uh, see how common tomatoes and chilies are. Five hundred years ago, they weren't part of our diets. Thank you, Stephen. A further issue, concern? Yeah, Nick. Uh, yeah. Yes, um, Stephen, uh, first of all, um, in connection with what you just said, can you say something about the, 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 the sort of development from classic wheat to new wheat types like spelt? Uh, which I think are, are, have caught on much more in, in Germany, possibly in continental Europe as a, as a whole, than in, in Britain. I, that's yeah. the impression I have anyway. Yeah, yes, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, absolutely. So, um, so spelt is in fact an old wheat. It's, it, it, spelt is in fact one of the, um, one of the relatives of, 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 of bread wheat. Um, and um, one, of the, one of the advantages of things like um, um, uh, things like spelt and some of its uh, uh, some of its close relatives, um, the, the durums and these types of things, is that they can occupy um, soils which don't need to be so highly fertilized. So, so bread wheat is um, requires a lot of input, a lot higher amount of fertilizer to get optimum yields. Whereas um, spelts, you can um, work onto more marginal um, onto more marginal lands. Um, and um, and of course um, those becomes come important with the unknown and 
unpredictable co consequences of things like um, of, of climate change. And of course, this is something that we, we, we need to factor in because our agricultural landscape is going to change. Um, and of course, um, uh, Germany has a, um, uh, a great tradition of using a um, um, of, of, of using a non-standard cereal um, uh, uh, for the, compared to a lot of the rest of Europe, um, and, and that's rye, um, mm. of course. And rye is is absolutely um, uh, is a fantastic producer on relatively poor soils. In the UK, that plant that that plant is taken uh, that position is taken up by oats. Um, but of course, um, rye has its own problems associated with it. Um, and most particularly, it has the problem associated with, with ergot and fungal infections and the, the LSD and St. Anthony's fire and uh, these, sorts of, uh, these sorts of things um, associated with it. But, um, but certainly things, uh, certainly these, um, what people are trying to do at the moment with uh, lots of these um, uh, uh, wheat cultivars, whether they're spelt, whether they're, uh, whether they're, they're bread wheats, is to take the things that we're familiar with and to try and introduce into those um, uh, genes that will allow them to grow in um, uh, lower nutrient, be highly productive in lower nutrient soils, i.e. they are the plants themselves are better at taking the nutrients, acquiring the nutrients that are available to them, um, but also in soils that are um, less than optimum, optimal. So, for example, they might have um, higher levels of, of salinity than you might normally expect, or they might actually be um, uh, uh, having less soil in them, not less soil, less water. In them, they might be less water retentive than you might wish. So again, it's trying to move things um, out of prime um, um, prime sites of, 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 of land into these into potentially these more marginal areas or these areas that traditionally people have said no, we're not going to grow um, wheat on. And of course, these things might change if people move more to a vegetable-based diet rather than a diet that's based around um, milk and cheese and meat and these sorts of things. Hmm. Wow, wow, wow. I, I don't want to monopolize, but I actually have another couple of questions, but Michel, may I go ahead or are there any other raised hands? Well, probably I can uh, uh, have one. Sure. Uh, I would like to learn about your view on the policy of the big seed and fertilizer companies uh, coercing uh, farmers uh, throughout the world into a dependency on their products and which impact does this have on the variety of plants when I think of uh, feeding African people, for example? Right. Um, I'm not going I'm, I'm to, I'm going to stop myself going and get, uh, uh, ranting. Um, <laughs> uh, no, um, I get particularly annoyed by this, uh, um, 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 this um, issue. Um, so, um, so the situation. So, so the situation is with um, uh, with uh, many commercial um, um, seed companies. No, I'm oh, sorry. I'll, I'll take I'll, I'll take a step back. So, um, so traditionally, um, uh, seeds have often been managed. Were often managed um, at local level. So there were seed there were there were, there were seed producers seed companies associated with local with with local areas. Certainly that was the case in um, um, in in the UK during the eighties and into the nineties. Then big multinationals started uh, started started buying up these um, um, these seed companies and um, regulating essentially what could be grown. So um, anything that couldn't be grown um, nationally or over a large area was removed from the list. And if you remove these things from the list, people no longer grow them. And if people no longer grow them, and then essentially those seeds become extinct, they become these so-called heritage varieties. And of course, this was aided to um, some extent by the European Communion, uh, 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 community and the EU in their agricultural um, regulations that um, uh, 
did not that, that meant that if you wanted to put seed into the commercial sector then you had to go through a whole regulatory process and unless you had a, a, a large enough market then you were never going to be able to um, get those um, those heritage seeds if you like into that marketplace and so what we have now is a situation where um, you have particularly the really large um, um, uh, seed, um, um, uh, seed companies um, selling essentially seed and um, uh, herbicide and fertilizer together as a single package. And you can't buy one without, um, um, without the other. And the other thing that is happening is um, that the, um, the, uh, the, there are mechanisms being put into place that prevent uh, people using their seed, uh, using, uh, transferring the seed from one year to the other, which is the traditional way of doing it. And of course, I, there are really good genetic reasons why a company doesn't want that to happen, because essentially it, it, there's a potential of outbreeding and it reduces the, the quality of their seed stock. But um, from, a, from the point of view of a local farmer, what it does, it means that they have to have a cash supply in order to buy that seed. Mm -hmm. But uh, it also means that in really bad years, they don't get a crop or are unlikely to get a crop because the value of the traditional system where you had lots of different cultivars being grown is that if there was a bad year, then it's unlikely that every single one of those cultivars would uh, be poorly yielding. You would at least get some crop, whereas that's not what is happening now, and 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 that's potentially um, causing um, um, causing serious uh, causing serious problems, um, and and of course, if people want to, if local uh, people want to um, put that seed into into a marketplace beyond the local marketplace, they're not allowed to, unless. They've got all the regulatory um, um, uh, certification, so it means that essentially the um, um, seed production um, is being uh, pushed into um, um, into a, a fewer and fewer players' hands. But this is something that started in Europe in the um, in the 1980s, um, and um, it was probably it was a long term strategy um, on the part of the seed companies, which. Um, I, I suspect that most people didn't uh, didn't see coming. Thanks for your insight, uh, Arif. Please. Yes. Hello. Uh, great lecture. Thank you. You mentioned just before um, that our our modern agricultural profile is basically dictated by our dependence on meat and and dairy. And I understand how that works. But for example, with soya because that's fed to animals, but is that also responsible for the huge growth of wheat and, and what, el what other um, uh, products are, are in that? So, so the, 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 other big, the other big product in that is, um, is sorghum. Uh -huh. okay. uh, sorghum is a really, and, and millet is, um, are, are the, the two other uh, major sources there. And, and, and in that case, those, those plants are really important for, um, for um, uh, chicken production. Mm -hmm. and chicken powder production and and um that's one of the reasons that we are of course seeing this great hike in food prices um um at the moment and particularly in, uh, uh um, egg and cheese prices is associated with um the um the the, la the, the, the high cost of um filling those um, um filling that uh, uh filling that space um uh, for um uh, for um for those for that production the other the the other plant uh, the other plant that i only mentioned slightly is sunflower and sunflower oil is again it's really important as an edible oil but it's also really important in, in as as uh, in terms of producing rations for um, um for animals and of course most of that is um uh, uh, at the moment uh, most of that comes from ukraine um, and so the, the, the global prices of um, of um, uh, uh, of um, sunflower, oil. sunflower oil have increased. Um, the irony 
of course, is that um, Sunflower itself is an American. It's, it was, was first domesticated by the American um, uh, 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 Native Americans. Um, but it was actually um, bred and seriously domesticated in um, in um, in in, uh, in um, late um, late nineteenth century Ukraine, um, and it was only um, it only ends up in back in the United States actually as a result of Cold War espionage in the nineteen fifties, <laughs> where these high quality seeds are moved back. Um, and um, but the uh, uh, but we shouldn't underestimate um, the, the 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 other plants that are involved in some of these animal production. So the, and, and the other one, of course, is date palm. Mm -hmm. um, OK, but if everybody turned vegan tomorrow, we'd still be growing a lot of wheat. It, it, so we'd still be growing. We would potentially be still be growing a lot, um, a, a lot of wheat. But. We might also be growing a much uh, a, 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 well. We might be growing a, a greater diversity of um, of things. Of course, the cereal that feeds most people, and in fact is the most environmentally damaging of the cereals, rice probably. overall is rice. Um, so um, uh, rice is another is, is 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 another one of 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 my of of my four um, that. Uh, it's the third one of my four that feeds that has sixty percent of our calorie intake, and the other big one for animal production, which is the fourth one, is maize. Mm -hmm. So zea maize is um, is is the other big uh, uh, animal food. Nick, what about your second question that you would like to put forward? Uh, you are unmute, please, Nick. Again. Um... Yeah, I actually have a, a, a number of questions, but I guess the, the two most important ones are, could you say a little bit about um, genetic energy engineering and um, uh, gene manipulated varieties? Are you are you a, a, a supporter? Are you deadly against? Do you have mixed views? I have mixed views. So um, I so uh, so. So we need to. Uh, it's a really complicated, really complicated area because there's, if, if you like, there's this, there's this idea of gene editing, which is the new, which is this new idea. Mm. There's genetic engineering, and there's, um, if you like, genetic manipulation. Genetic manipulation can be thought of as traditional plant breeding. So traditional plant breeding, plant breeders have used um, uh, 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 approaches of hybridization, introducing genes. Um, back crossing for uh, for generations forever, even before we even did it consciously. Um, the, the 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 genetic engineering that came to the fore in the late 1990s and caused so much um, angst with um, with people is um, associated with um, the fact that people can move genes across uh, across wide species barriers. So, for example, you can you can move um, genes from insects into um, um, into maize, for example. That's what BT resistance is. Yeah. Um, but the if you but but uh, and then of course there's the associated concerns associated with human health and with the um, with release the minute the release of those genes into the environment. Now. Personally, um, I'm not too worried about the um, the human health um, um, uh, issues. Those are the those are the, because those are the easier. That's the easier thing to investigate. The, the the long term problem potentially is that of the release, the accidental release of these genes into the wild through crossing between crops and wild species, and we know that this happens all the time. So. Um, that's why I've got this equiv equivocacy. So, for example, in the UK, I would have no problems about um, growing genetically engineered maize because there are no wild relatives of, of maize in, in, in Britain. I would have lots of concerns about the uh, growing genetically engineered sugar beet because we've, um, we've got lots of uh, wild relatives. And I would also have 
big concerns about growing genetically engineered oilseed rape for, ex for exactly the same reasons. Mm. But um, genetically engineered um, uh, maize, potatoes, I'd have no problems with. Gene editing is something different again. So in, so in the case of gene editing, you don't involve a, a, um, an, another species um, that's, uh, that's, widely, that's widely different. What you have is um, we, we have these techniques now that you can that essentially act like sort of um, scissors and tweezers to pull uh, and uh, to enable you to essentially dissect a gene and then insert a piece of, um, in fact, sometimes it's just a single, single chemical base into a piece of DNA to change the function of the gene. And that's what they mean by, um, by gene editing. So it, it, that happens just at a, at, at a, single, um, at a, at a single point in the DNA. It, it, it doesn't involve taking across a gene from another species and everything else that that, um, that, that might involve. I don't see any other hand. So Nick, do you have uh, a last question? Because I think Stephen also deserves some time to relax before he hops on the on the plane tomorrow morning <laughs> by six. <laughs> well, although although ten is it ten days on Tenerife? It doesn't yep. sound that it doesn't sound <laughs> that terrible to me. <laughs> it, 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 it'll be great. It'll be great. It's uh, uh, it always is. Uh, yeah, well, actually, I, I did have a, another list of questions, but I won't ask, ask any of those. But that that uh, prompts me to say that, Stephen, you have to come back uh, and you, sorry, come back. Talk to us again next mm -hmm. time in person. Yeah, no, it'd be great. We, we will take you to dinner. We will ask you all of those other questions and we will introduce you to Apfelwein. <laughs> OK, well, look, before I say a, a final word of thanks to you and, and to everyone who has attended, I have some housekeeping, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, because we have a lot of things coming up in the in the next um, few weeks or rather in the next two months. Um, first of all, in, in early May, I will be on HR on um, HR one talking about the coronation. Um, about which I'm not a huge fan, but uh, they want they want to interview me. Secondly, of course, on May the 6th, we have the coronation itself. Um, now, there isn't a specific event uh, organized by the DBG um, around that, but I, I, I'm sure many of you will take a look on TV. I personally will not be able to, um, to look at it live because I have a long-standing commitment away from home, uh, but maybe I can, I can see a recording. Uh, moving from the coronation to um, a coronation party, there is a coronation party combined with the King's birthday party being organized by the honorary consul for June the 27th. And the DBG will be a, a, a sponsor of that event. Uh, and therefore we will get a contingent of um, a quota of, of possible invites to the event. But please mark it in your, in your diaries already, the 27th of June. For members only. It'll be for members only because it'll be, yeah, quite an, uh, an exclusive event. Um, secondly, unfortunately, also on the same day, um, there is a performance of Romeo and Juliet by the, the new theatre company taking place at uh, Schloss Hotel Kornberg. Um, and we'll circulate details of that a little bit later, but um, that there's, there, there are two other performances on the following day, that's June the 28th, at 11 a.m. and, um, and 7.30 p.m. Coming back to, to May, um, the, on, on, the, on May the 25th, um, the next DBG event will be Catherine Mason talking to us about German literature as taught at UK schools. Um, and um, on June the 3rd, there is something called the British Symposium and the British Weekend. Um, it's there are details on LinkedIn, but I haven't been able to access them properly. Uh, if we if and when we have full details, um, we will try to circulate them. But it's something that um, some of our members attended, I think, last year. It takes place near Hanover um, and is supposed to be uh, quite a jolly event. On June the 12th, we intend to hold our we plan to hold our AGM, our Mitgliederversammlung. 
Um, and I think that is the end of the list of things which I wanted to mention to you. That's correct, yeah. Um, so after this evening, having heard, first of all, an absolutely tremendous talk by Stephen, um, and secondly, having um, heard the, the list of events that I've just mentioned for the next um, six or seven or eight weeks, if there's anybody in the audience who is not yet a, a member of the DBG, <laughs> particularly in Rhine mine but uh, other members other 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 chapters are acceptable too please very seriously consider becoming a member because it's really worthwhile so on that um, I'd like to give a round of applause to Stephen for an absolutely brilliant talk thank you very much and we look forward to welcoming you back thank you very much it's been a pleasure and have a great time in Tenerife right. great great right Good night. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you for attending. Bye bye. Okay. bye. Thanks. Bye. Good night. All the best to you. Bye bye, Frau Roth. Bye, Ursula. Bye bye. So, okay. Yes, bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye, Ursula. Mm -hmm. Nick, uh, this was a unique approach into the world of plants, wasn't it? Oh, it was brilliant. Absolutely wow. amazing. Fantastic. <laughs> okay. Schönen Abend. Gell? Tschüss. Schönen Abend. Yeah. Bye. Ciao, bye. ciao.